France 24 and UNESCO present Welcome to what must be one of the most beautiful ancient sites on the planet. We're here on Carthage in Tunisia, a site that uh, began its history almost 3,000 years ago. It was the centre of a, a huge empire that stretched right across the Mediterranean. In fact, it was destroyed and then it was rebuilt by the Romans. Well, thanks to the uh, protections that have been given to this site, much of it remains intact. The baths are still here, the theatre and indeed the Forum as well. Well, we're here today to bring you this very special programme on the north coast of Africa in association with UNESCO. And first of all, we're going to uh, find out a little bit more about Carthage. And I'm joined by my first guest on the programme, Nazarin Nazar from the National Heritage Institute in Tunis. Thanks very much for being with us, Nazarin. First of all, just um, tell us a bit more about Carthage itself. I mean, why is it so important to cite? You know, Carthage is at the list of uh, World Heritage since 1979. This is, of course, thanks to the opulence of its sites and monuments. And in reality, it's occupied a very strategic situation. It's on the crossroad of the two basins of Mediterranean, and it occupies uh, the bottom of the, the peninsula of the Gulf of Tunis. And we're coming to this uh, amazing villa site here. There's some specific things that you really want to talk about, including the mosaics. In reality, we are on the well-preserved uh, Roman house of Carthage. Called, we call it the uh, House of Avery, La Villa de la Volière. Uh, it's named after the mosaic of its peristyle. We have a nice catalogue of birds. That is why we have Avery uh, House. Uh, in reality, it's not the unique mosaic that we have. Uh, we have another one, which is so big, composed about 190 squares. We have Panel, small panel of mosaic showing horses, mm -hmm. and also we have scene of mythology. For example, we have the representation of Sappho, and small also panel with different types of marble. And uh, also here there's uh, beautiful statues which we can see too. Of course, we, we, we know that Roman was very interested by art, by decoration, so we have some statue. And uh, for Carthage, we have a very nice uh, speciality. We have local atelier, we have sculpture dine in Carthage, but also they use it to import sculpture from Greece. Mm -hmm. And we recognize this, of course, thanks to the quality of marble and decoration. And for example, here we have a nice uh, notable with its tunic, uh, but also we have a nice representation of scene of mythology with Apollo, the god of beauty and love. Perfectly fitting. Um, I wanted to finish by asking you, Nizreen, just why you're so passionate about this site. I mean, what is it that really attracts you to it? Uh, Carthage is so interesting, you know. And uh, we believe that we have to preserve it because we consider that it belongs to the future generation. For example, you know, in our constitution, on the Article 42, we have at the end that the state preserve the heritage, the patrimony to the future generation. Okay. Perfect. Thanks very much for being it's with us pleasure. on the programme today. Nazarene uh, Nazar from the National Heritage Institute in uh, Tunis, thanks very much. Thank you. Well, we're going to show you a little bit more of the site now. We're going to meet um, some of my uh, guests in just a moment. But first of all, perhaps this is a, a moment when we should think about uh, heritage itself a little bit and ask ourselves, do we all actually know what heritage is? Well, this is the moment to find out. Let's find out a little bit more in this from Andrew Hillier. They've stood the test of time. Kerouan in Tunisia, Essaouira in Morocco, Algeria's Tasseli Niger, an iconic prehistoric site, Australia's Blue Mountains, the Mahabalipuram temples in India. Whether they're treasures that are cultural, natural, in one country or across several, they're all part of our heritage. The works of the architect Le Corbusier, for example, span many countries. At its most basic level, heritage is what we inherit. It can be a house, a painting, or jewellery. But on a larger scale, that heritage can belong to a country, or even the world. Heritage is divided into two categories, cultural and natural. Living heritage. Treasure that needs protection. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization has a list of sites at risk.
But all is not lost. What has been damaged can still be repaired. Looking after our heritage is one way of protecting it, and that's the only way to pass it down to future generations. So there you go, that's what heritage is. But let's find out a little bit more. We're going to talk to uh, my guests who are joining us here on the programme. And with us is uh, Karim Handili. He's Head of uh, Culture at UNESCO's uh, regional office for the Maghreb. Also Leila ben Gassam. She's a consultant and founder of Blue Fish, which is uh, an organisation which designs and implements projects that target heritage preservation and cultural diversity. And Ednan El Ghali is an architect who's worked for several UN agencies and international organisations in the fields of development and cultural heritage. Thanks to all of you for coming coming in talking to us today. Karim, I want to start with you. We saw that film just a few moments ago which showed us exactly what uh, heritage is. I mean, what do you think it is and, and what is so important about it? Well, I mean, this film shows a, something absolutely amazing, which is the diversity of, of heritage in the world. I mean, uh, we are about to celebrate next year the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. And what's very important is that Beyond the safeguarding of these iconic sites, the convention has become with time an incredible tool for the safeguarding of heritage beyond the World Heritage List, actually. And the recognition of this diversity is absolutely uh, essential to preserve those testimonies from the past. I mean, we saw examples like the, the works of Le Corbusier, which is an incredible contribution to modern heritage. So even the categories of heritage we are dealing with today are really uh, new and uh, it brings also a lot of, uh, of support to this uh, work we're trying to do for this diversity. And this is very important for this shared heritage. And I think this notion of shared heritage, not only belonging to one country or to one region, to the world, and this shared responsibility is something that is, we think is important to highlight. And Leila, we were talking before we came on air, I mean, you're a businesswoman and, and you see as well the way that uh, business can kind of help and be involved in that process even. Yeah, I think we underestimate the potential of our heritage and culture to create opportunities. Uh, I think it could be an important tool that local governments should, should consider uh, in their territorial marketing. And I think that's the best way to preserve it uh, by uh, um, communities appropriating their heritage and designing um, designing, uh, repurposing it for their, for their reality. And I think heritage needs to be, um, I think it's, it's priceless to have this, this, um, this, this important heritage that we have inherited, but also heritage is dynamic. It needs to be readapted, it needs to be repurposed, um, and youth needs to be part of it to, to give it new meaning. Yeah, we're going to see a film about that a little bit later on. I mean, Adam, would you agree with that? Heritage is dynamic. I mean, it might not sound like a, a natural phrase, but it, it's a nice way of putting it, isn't it? Of course. I think what we saw in the last decades is the, the total implication and commitment of the local civil society. It changed a lot in the last 10 years because civil society make itself uh, more present and advocate for the preservation of the most remarkable building of our heritage. It was not really the case before. Of course, civil society organizations were present in the field, but since 2011 they are more present than ever and they are advocating for this preservation and playing a key role. Well, at this point, we're going to um, show you a few other uh, sites as well here in Tunisia. We can show you a map, in fact, just uh, which shows the, the seven, there are indeed seven uh, different UNESCO uh, sites right across uh, Tunisia. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of them. First of all, um, Karine, I know you particularly wanted to pick out the Medina of Sousse and the Medina of Caravan to mention. Why are those two places uh, that you particularly wanted to, to talk about today? Well, they are very important because they are uh, testimonies to the evolution of human occupation in this land, I mean, in history. Also because of their role as, uh, at some point, in terms of uh, connecting this land with uh, surrounding uh, territories and beyond also uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So this is very important because we can, through these sites, understand the way people inhabited this land at that time, and then the evolution since then and also, it gives a lot of information on other aspects, like the architectural practices, uh, what kind of uh, techniques, what kind of materials were used. And uh, also, and this is very important, I guess, to highlight concerning urban heritage, is that uh, there is a complexity of this uh, living heritage, and also taking into account the fact that you have the intangible heritage that is absolutely essential. And you cannot separate, and this is something important, 
we have to highlight. We, we call it, uh, in our jargon, the synergies between the conventions uh, linked to UNESCO, which is to take into account the fact that heritage has ma many, many aspects and that the interaction between them is important. And final word, and I would like also to take this opportunity to say that this year we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of a very important normative instrument, that is the recommendation on the historic urban landscape. This recommendation brings a new way of looking at the territory dealing with urban development. We are on a site here that is also facing the pressure mm. of urban development. So it is the case of Medinas like Sousse and Karwan, but others in the country and beyond. And this is important because this new way of looking at the territory, considering interaction between all those uh, components, econo economy, social issues, etc., gives more tools in order to safeguard on a sustainable way, that heritage. And Leila, do you agree with that? I mean, bringing lots of different organizations and lots of different groups of people together is the way to, to kind of develop and, and ensure that heritage thrives? Yes, for sure, especially when we talk about Medinas. It's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, they face tremendous urban challenge, um, as Karim said, it's in, in, in preserving um, the architectural um, uh, re heritage, but also um, repurposing it in a way that respects um, the, the heritage, but also um, gives it a new meaning for today's life. And I think um, from my experience in the Medina of Tunis, it's extremely important that um, all parties come together. Um, and I think this, this is another, <laughs> another challenge in Tunisia. Private-public partnership is, is a long way to go. Uh, but I think um, there's, there's a lot of, um, not only civil society, but also private sector, social entrepreneurs are coming together um, to create new realities that, that, that cause change bottom-up. Yeah. And Adnan, uh, Leila there mentioned the Medina of Tunis. I know you've uh, been working there as well, haven't you? Of course, and I think in the Medina of Tunis what is very interesting is that many different organizations and civil society organizations also uh, were able to work together. Uh, that's really the solution. I think the heritage is not only about buildings, it's uh, mainly about communities also. So we need to work together and we need a better, uh, a better coordination also in communication between all the stakeholders. And we saw in the film as well um, uh, that uh, it's not just individual sites that are around the world which are also important. Uh, Karim, we can show some images as well of uh, several mosaics which are particularly important artifacts which people here in Tunisia are, are trying to, to keep uh, restored at Udna and also at Hydra. And you feel that that's uh, very important as well, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's important. And actually, it's interesting that you mentioned this case because um, it brings uh, interesting uh, thoughts. Um, for instance, when an, an object that important, like a mosaic, for instance, is found on an archaeological site, the practice before was to move this mosaic to the National Museum, for instance, uh, in the capital in general, um, which, of course, was a sort of guarantee of protection and proper conservation, because not in all countries you have means everywhere to conserve heritage. But at the same time, then, uh, with reflection, it appeared that it was a, so, somehow a pity to move an iconic uh, archaeological object from its setting, because also having it in its setting uh, allows understanding more about what this object tells. This being said, when you keep an object in an archaeological site, particularly in a remote area, or in an area where you don't have those tools to conserve, then you have to make sure that you can make proper conservation and also very important to ensure proper protection against uh, um, I mean um, destruction vandalism uh, pillaging potential uh, illegal extraction from the site and then illicit trafficking so it's a kind of balance to be found but the reflection is somehow more and more towards keeping those objects and also making those places attractive. Imagine a person coming to visit Tunisia and hearing about this incredible mosaic of Hydra. Rather than having it in the Badwa Museum here or somewhere else, where it would be certainly very well presented and protected, going to that place is also part of the discovery and part of the, let's say, of the, of the story that this object Tense. Leila, do you think that's possible though? I mean, isn't that slightly difficult? I mean, Karim uh, indicated as well in his answer that actually, although the ideal is to do that, that involves money, doesn't it? Either coming from governments or from some kind of uh, private initiative. 
Uh, I totally agree with Karim. I think, again, uh, I can't emphasize the point uh, enough. I think local communities need to appropriate their own heritage. It needs to be part of the territorial marketing. The municipalities need to um, document, publish uh, what heritage they have, and they use it um, as, 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 uh, ter for territorial marketing, for local development, uh, for creating ecosystems that will create economic income um, for nationals that will, that will understand the meaning, uh, but also appropriate uh, the heritage. So I totally agree. I think uh, in Tunisia, there's not, I don't think there's a hectare without a, a piece of heritage that we can tell a story about, uh, whether it could even be natural heritage or farming heritage. And uh, I think uh, the local communities need to appropriate and use it to, to attract investors, to attract private sector, to make a positive story for young people in their communities. It doesn't make it difficult for, for tourists, though, if it's part of uh, tourism. Let's face it, heritage is part of tourism, isn't it? But uh, if you are a tourist and you come to Tunisia, if you can go to one place and see everything, isn't it kind of easier than having to go to, to 14 different places? Um, I'm an elected city councillor in a small town <laughs> yeah. um, behind the mountain over there. And uh, I strongly believe that it's municipalities that need to be involved again, uh, because that's, they will create the ecosystem um, for travel, for logistics, uh, licensing um, what is needed as uh, restaurants, toilets, anything that is needed to make the site um, ha have a purpose in its own community. I think moving everything to the capital or to big cities deprives um, communities that are rich in heritage um, and important potential for economic development. Okay, well, thanks very much for being with us. We're going to uh, continue the debate very shortly here on France 24 in this very special programme from this beautiful site here at uh, Carthage in Tunisia. So do stay with us. We'll be back uh, right after the news, so don't go away. France 24 and UNESCO present... Well, welcome back uh, here on France 24. We're at Carthage in Tunisia for the second half of this programme. We're talking about uh, heritage in this uh, special programme in conjunction with UNESCO. We're going to start off by asking the question, how do you ensure that young people are just as engaged, in fact, in heritage as perhaps the older generation? Well, we're going to take you, in fact, to a different site here in Tunisia. This is the El Gem Amphitheatre uh, in the country, not that far from here, in fact. You may just recognise it if you're a fan of Monty Python from the film The Life of Brian. Let's find out a little bit more in the report, then, from Seyfel Marchette and Andrew Hillier. These school children are about to come face to face with a towering testament to Tunisia's stunning Roman past. Up until now, they've known nothing of its importance. The El Jam Amphitheatre has been listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1979, but the visitors mostly come from abroad. Faisal, on a visit with his own nieces and nephew, hopes to show them why it's worth seeing. Visits to archaeological treasures like these aren't normally included in Tunisia's school curriculums. At best, school children can hope for one or two trips over the entire course of their education. History teachers argue that schools should be spending more money on showing pupils why their cultural heritage is so important by bringing them to sites like these. Back in its heyday, the El Jam Amphitheatre towered 35 metres high over three levels with enough space for 30,000 spectators to watch the gladiators in bloody combat below. It's one of Tunisia's most visited sites, but even though most Tunisians know it by name, many don't know where it is. 
المسرح الروماني بلجم هو ثاني اكبر مسرح موجود في الدوله الرومانيه أه هنا نلاحظوا نسبه الزوار ونسبه الاقبال الزائر من الخارج اكثر من الزائر التونسي على يوصل 3% الزائر التونسي لهذا المعلم With financial support from the US embassy the amphitheater is now undergoing renovation works that should give the monument the facelift it needs to ensure Tunisia's heritage stands tall well into the future Well, let's talk then uh, more with my guests on the programme about the issues raised in that report. Uh, with me is uh, Karim Hendili from uh, Head of Culture at UNESCO's Regional Office uh, for the Maghreb. Leila Ben Gassam is a consultant and founder of Blue Fish, an organisation that designs and implements projects that target uh, heritage preservation and cultural diversity. And Adnan El Ghali is an architect who's worked for several UN agencies uh, and international organisations in the fields of development and cultural heritage. Thanks for being with us uh, once again. Adnan, I'm going to start with you this time. I mean, watching that film, were kind of two main issues um, which came out of it. One is about how uh, the actual people of Tunisia are perhaps not quite so engaged with uh, some of these sites as they might be, and also that main and central issue of how you get younger people involved as well. Of course, I think this film is about transmission and the importance of transmission, this taste for heritage. This, uh, and, and here we have to think about uh, maybe our modus operandi, the way we are working when we are dealing with heritage. Uh, we are working by silos, the experts alone, the international organization alone, the civil society alone, private sector alone. So maybe what we need to do is to, to, to strengthen this coordination, to strengthen this work together, and also to, to focus on transmission and initiation to heritage. What can we do? What can we change maybe in our curricula in our schools to make people feel and local community feel uh, feel uh, that there is more access to their heritage feel proud of their heritage and uh, and this is really needed i think because we cannot do without local communities we cannot act without them so leila how do we go about that then i think i think um, the the revolution has liberated culture somehow and uh, there are a lot of um, especially in my work i meet a lot of young people who are Uh, almost hungry for uh, to, to be involved in, in the heritage preservation process. Uh, of course, that can be in many ways. Uh, it could be, I think, one very important way is documenting. And I think when you document it, you save it because it's known that it's yours. And I think there's a few NGOs that are, have been very active in documenting and uh, digitalizing and even uploading information on Wikipedia. Um, there's also um, uh, a lot of uh, young people who are uh, getting together to, uh, um, to create tours in their communities, trying to uh, look for um, local heritage stories that they can share with guests. Uh, but also lately, um, we have done a crowdfunding campaign for, to restore a historical building in the Medina of Tunis. And I was positively surprised by the number of young people, volunteers, who um, some can, some can't, but many uh, were present to, to paint, to... So to there help. are younger people who are interested, uh, Yes, architects yeah. gave their time for free. So uh, I, think, I think they're looking for um, um, the opportunity to participate um, in um, repurposing, but also preserving and documenting. And is that something that, Karine, that you can work with within UNESCO as well, trying to encourage all sorts of different groups and organizations to become involved in, in heritage protection? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, again, experience has shown that in any case, it's not uh, the responsibility of one party in any case, but also in terms of, of means. I mean, it's really uh, a shared effort. And engaging, we're talking about young people. I mean, young people also, of course, it has become kind of, of course, of co focus saying that, okay, we have to have these young people engaged into heritage safeguarding. The issue is that it cannot go alone. It is part of a, a, a wider process, which starts from really the top, which is what vision for heritage do we have at the level of every country? Uh, because with this vision, then you put the tools that you need to put a policy. We talk about cultural policy, which is, of course, culture which is, which is wider than heritage. And uh, as UNESCO, we deal with culture in general, because not only with heritage, but also with all what's links to uh, creative economy, all what is linked to culture as a, as a sort of broad concept. And um, so having young people, they have to be part of the process. So at some point, they, they, are, they have very, very good will, they have energy, but you need others as well. And also, from the institutional point of view, it cannot be responsibility only of the national authority or institution. Engaging local governments and local authorities is absolutely essential. And finally, which is very important, 
even at the level of every country, it is not only the institution in charge of culture and heritage that has a responsibility to work on the safeguarding of heritage. So we, we use a sentence somehow to, 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 to raise awareness about this and say, ideally, we should be moving from institutions in charge of heritage and culture to institutions concerned by culture and heritage. And then you open really that to a lot of institutions which may think that they are not concerned by heritage, but at the end you can see that they can really potentially act, act very, very strongly. Later, I want to come back on something you mentioned just a moment ago, the revolution. Um, for our viewers who, who perhaps don't know, Tunisia was uh, really at the heart, I suppose, of the Arab Spring 10 years ago, uh, deposed its uh, president, who'd been in power for 23 years, Ben Ali, and since then uh, has turned to democracy instead. I mean, Leila, has that helped the situation for heritage? Is, is there more of a, uh, an open-minded approach to it, do you think? Uh, I think it's went both ways, <laughs> just like any, everything else. Uh, I think there's more um, maybe illicit trade because the government is weakened, there's uh, corruption. Uh, but also, on the other hand, uh, there's, uh, I think, um, there's a big democratization in culture today. I mean, I, th I feel at least before, Adnan can correct me, of course, but I think before the revolution, it was a little bit elitist and administration. Uh, but after the revolution, it's kind of democratized culture. And uh, it's, it's, it's being, um, I think, I, again, I'm going to say the, again that um, heritage is dynamic. And I think now the new generation with the newfound freedom, um, there's plenty of new cultures that are being, <laughs> uh, are being are be emerging now, uh, which will shape our future. Uh, but I think that the newfound um, democracy has also democratized the way we preserve, we rethink, and uh, this has caused a challenge uh, on our administration. And I like what you said. We need administrations that are concerned about heritage. It's not that just um, their mission. Uh, and with, with the administration, we, we try very hard to, to work with them, of course, to collaborate and find ways to, um, to, to make heritage preservation a success together. Uh, but there's also, um, there's also general thinking that you, you preserve by freezing something which is, uh, it's, it's, it's a big debate, you know, do you, do, you, do you repurpose or do you preserve it the way it is? And this, of course, is a very big debate. But uh, I think uh, I'm a strong believer in uh, private-public partnership, which is, uh, used to be just, um, I mean, now the law is uh, existing, but it's very hard to implement. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're not going to give up. Uh, we're going to keep on pushing and trying to uh, create opportunities uh, where, uh, parties, multi-parties can come together and give new meanings to, um, to, our, to our sites. And then do you think there's been real change since the revolution? Yes, I think yes. As Leida said, we have now local communities very, uh, very committed to the preservation of heritage. Also because uh, there is not anymore this uh, very important presence of the state. So, for example, they see the heritage as part of their own life, but they don't know it. So they are just asking for tools to, 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 a better, to access to a better knowledge of heritage. And also heritage sometimes can reflect, can be the, the footprint of lost communities of, uh, or of minorities of, or, or of specific uh, cultural practices that are not recognized uh, as a, in the state level. But in the local level, that's very important. Uh, so I think we have to work uh, on this, and we cannot work on this without, uh, without the, local, uh, the local communities. How much of a problem is looting? You mentioned the, the, the local level there. I mean, working on a, on, a, on a daily basis, if you like, with, with different heritage sites and organizations, I mean, how, how significant a problem is that, and, and how can we can try to control it? I think, first of all, the problem is, is, is an old problem. It's not a new problem of routine. What happened is that sometimes we are not even able, even in the administration, for example, to define what is an artifact that has to be preserved and what is not. Uh, so it's very difficult. Here we are, uh, we are suffering from the lack uh, of laws, from the lack of regulation. And here we need, for example, a specific expertise that we don't have really locally and we can ask for. And here, for example, the question of routine is linked to the privile privileged relation we have with international national organization and we have to, 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 to seek help and to seek support to be able to define that. And of course looting is a threat to, to our sites, uh, but we have also to, to define the tools to be able to, to handle this and to solve this problem. 
I mean, Lena, do you, I, it's such a massive site, just this one site here at Carthage, and we've talked about some of the, the numerous other sites in Tunisia. I mean, trying to protect individual huge sites like this and the artifacts of the time. I mean, it's a lot of investment, a lot of uh, time and money, isn't it? Yes, for sure. And I think, um, I think um, I'm going to mention again that I, I really think that if we document and we publish uh, what we have, that's, uh, that's one way um, to... Um, make looting um, more challenging. <laughs> yeah. But of course, uh, as Adnan said, it's, it has been going on for, for centuries. Uh, but I, again, it's, it's the communities that need to appropriate. And I think, um, as Karim said also, I don't think it's, it's the, the task of the, the government only. I think really it's, it's, uh, it, it needs to be uh, the neighborhood. <laughs> needs to, to, uh, to feel the ownership of the sites around them and the, the municipalities need to improve licensing and opportunities, guest houses, restaurants, cafes, to make it, um, to, to, to create economic opportunities beyond looting. <laughs> I mean, Karim, it's never going to go away, though, however much you do, is it? Yeah, I mean, looting is, um, I mean, is, is, is a real issue. I mean, the, it's very lucrative. I mean, let's, uh, I mean, let's face uh, things as they are. I mean, it's very lucrative. And the problem also is that um, the network dealing with this, this traffic at the level of the world is connected to other traffics as well. So it's very powerful. It has an incredible capacity to adapt to measures taken here and there. That's why, I mean, the, the basis is cooperation between the countries. We generally consider the 1970 Convention as sort of, of a net in which you shouldn't have any breach. Otherwise, it's, the, it's there that everybody will go to move objects and to export them illicitly, etc. Something also very important is that uh, the involvement of security forces, customs, uh, the Ministry of Justice, for instance, who may not be perceived generally when we talk about heritage as, as, as a normal and immediate partners in this, we can see it when we do training workshops on this and capacity building, and we see that you have already pre-connections that you can use, and also you have to be innovative. For instance, you have laws and regulations in terms of customs, for instance. They can be used, they can be reinforced with the aspect of heritage, but sometimes in some countries you have already in those laws provisions that allows you really to to ensure a quite good protection on this. I want to fin finish the program by asking um, you two who are actually from here in Tunisia. I mean, it's all very well to talk about this, isn't it? I mean, luckily we're here, we're doing this program, we're all talking about it, we're all hopeful um, that, that it'll bring real change. But how do you ensure that actually these words turn into actions? Leila? Uh, again, I think, I think uh, it, it, you have added more partners, more people into the ecosystem. And I think it, should, it needs to be, it, the, the issue needs to be um, uh, shared by all uh, sectors, uh, ministries, but again, and I think it was talked about a lot, young people, getting young people, um, making young people feel um, the, the wealth uh, of their heritage and feel pride, feel united to protect it. Um, again, Karim made it sound uh, with the, with the, important uh, supply chains worldwide, I think this will That's be important. a challenge, yes. Adnan, do you agree with that? Yes, I totally agree. Uh, and, uh, and I can say what we need, we have living communities that are changing, and uh, we need a living heritage for living communities. And here we are really to, to break this way of acting by silos and to, to be able to work together. But it will go also with an implementation of new regulation and reinforcing, uh, as said Karim, the existing regulations that are not sufficient anymore. Well, great to have uh, the three of you with us today at what is uh, just such a fantastic site uh, here at Carthage in Tunisia. Of course, the debate will go on and there'll be a lot more special programmes coming up here on France 24. But thanks very much for joining us uh, from this beautiful site here in Carthage today. <laughs>